So welcome, welcome back to this um, second part of this afternoon's um, uh, session. Um, um, you all at home have a view on us as audience here. And, and um, well, thank you for showing yourself up. Um, it's a great pleasure for me to introduce to you uh, Professor Dr. David Rose Marin. Um, um, he arrived yesterday evening after a bit of delay. His, his plane was um, um, delayed, but nevertheless, he arrived uh, about around um, eight o'clock. So we had a, a brief um, a meeting. Um, he's director of the Spirituality and Mental Health a program at McLean Hospital and associate professor for psychology at Harvard Medical School Department of Psychiatry. That means that he lives in the area of Boston. Actually, he lives in the city of uh, Boston. He studied with Kenneth Pargament, um, and his field of study is the relevance of spirituality to mental health and especially how clinicians could address that area of life. So his spirituality, religion, and CBT, a guide for clinicians, is one of his uh, books. And as we all know, helping clinicians to become acquainted with all the material there is, how to use it in therapy, and especially how to feel free to uh, use it is one of the major concerns also of this conference. And Dr. Rose Marin has a lot of experience with innovative strategies in order to help clinicians with that. Today, he is going to talk about such an innovative program. Um, uh, it's called SPIRIT, Spiritual Psychotherapy for Inpatient Residential and Intensive Treatment. It's a group psychotherapy program. So um, we are, I'm very curious about what you will tell us, uh, and I'm happy to give you the floor. Thank you very much for the gracious introduction and for the warm welcome to, uh, to Amsterdam, despite the fact that I will never fly KLM again. <laughs> Delta has a direct flight from Boston. It's okay. Um, so good afternoon. It's a real honor and pleasure to be here. How many folks here, I guess this is going to be hard to do with the Zoom, but at least the people in front of me, how many folks are clinicians? And this could be, and I realize this is a multidisciplinary conference, so it could be people in nutrition or people in psychiatry or any field where you're actually seeing patients. 50%-ish? Okay, no, a little more, a little more than that. Okay, good. Um, fine. I hope to make this broadly. I am a clinician and I'm a clinician innovator and, and trainer and educator. That's primarily what I do at Harvard Medical School is helping clinicians to learn about how to integrate spirituality into mental health care. That's my job. Um, however, I think there are theological uh, implications of this. I'm not a theologian, I'm a religious individual, um, but I think there are theological implications of this. I think there are philosophical implications of this. And I think for those of us in social psychology, there might be some implications too. So at a minimum, I hope not to be boring. Um, what I wanna do is tell you a story. Um, the story starts with modest beginnings and it led to the rollout of a spiritually integrated therapy program throughout the entirety of McLean Hospital, which is a over 200 year old psychiatric hospital in the Northwest United States in, in Belmont, Mass. It has now 250 beds with specialized units for pretty much anything, uh, depression and anxiety, psychosis, uh, substance and alcohol abuse disorders, both detox and then more longer term, there is a specialized unit just for obsessive compulsive disorder, separate for anxiety and depression. Another one, uh, simply for eating disorders. Um, there are uh, units for children, units for older adults, um, you know, longer term psychosis, shorter term psychosis. It is a specialized hospital within the system and a really wonderful laboratory to be able to test out 
um, all sorts of things. Um, anyhow, so the story starts again with modest beginnings and led to the rollout of this treatment. Prior to the pandemic, uh, spirit was being provided to 3,500 patients every year throughout all of McLean Hospital by 22 different clinicians. And I swear that just happened. I had very little to do with it. Um, in fact, this is really the people who had a lot to do with it and many more. Um, to, in, order, in order to do spirituality and, and mental health research, you need a team. Um, you also need funding. And I'm very grateful spe specifically to the Bridges Consortium and Don John Templeton Foundation for their support of my work. Okay, and of course my uh, graduate mentor, Kenneth Pargament, Ken, uh, Harold Koenig as well, and many others. Okay, it was my first week as a psychology fellow at McLean. And I was brought there just to study cognitive behavior therapy and its application with acute psychiatric patients, having nothing to do with religion or spirituality. My curriculum vita showed that I was interested in spirituality because, hey, I studied with Ken Pargament and I had a bunch of publications. I also am a religious individual. I wear, uh, I have my hat on today. I, I wear a yarmulke to, to work as an Orthodox Jewish individual. And within a week of being there, there was a patient who came over to me. We'll name her Brienne. And Brienne comes to me um, during my lunch break, during her lunch break in the program, in the acute psychiatry program where we're stationed. And she says, um, uh, excuse me, can I speak to you about God? So. I'm an intern and I don't wanna get fired uh, because I've been working very hard to get this position for a long time. So I didn't know what to say or what to do. And then there was light. Um, I, I didn't know what to say or what to do. So I said to Brienne, you know, you should probably speak to the chaplain. So then I, I didn't know though at the time that we did, McLean Hospital did not have a chaplain. So I kind of just scurried off and said, like, that was weird. And, you know, let's just, you know, try not to get fired. And, and that was it. Because um, I wasn't the right address. Uh, I'm, I was a lowly intern. I'm just learning about how to do cognitive and dialectical behavior therapy with acute psychiatric patients. I certainly am not interested in speaking to them about their spiritual lives. This is a thorny subject. I don't want them to get upset. I don't want to get upset. Let's just, like, leave it and keep it sanitized. And if I want to study this, then I'll do it in the academy, not with my patients. Problem is that Brienne was not alone. Within the first six months of being there, 12 patients came over to me, everyone with pretty much the same question. Um, excuse me, can I please speak to you about God, spiritual struggle, faith? Why is God doing this to me? Why am I depressed for the fifth time? Does God hate me? And like, I've become the chaplain. Great. Um, that is not a good thing. Um, so I went to my advisors, um, Dr. Thruster Bjorgvinson, um, who is from Iceland and has never believed in God, and who knows, probably never will, um, who is like a virulent atheist. And he leans across the desk and he says to me, and I'm like, oh dear, I'm in trouble. And he says, Ross Marin, you got to do something about this. Many of our patients apparently want to speak about spirituality and you're the one who's going to fix this. So I'm like, okay, well, at least I didn't get fired and at least I have permission now, but what do I say and what do I do and where do I start? Like I've studied this empirically, but that's a very different story to actually speak to a patient, an acute psychiatric distressed patient who probably has sutures in their arm because they just cut themselves. Like this is, this is, this is serious and the stakes are high. So I had to get it right. So I looked in the literature, I called Ken Pargament. He said, I got nothing for you. So I'm like, great, <laughs> now I'm really in trouble. You know, looking to the heavens, like, what do I do? Um, and I created a cognitive behavior therapy protocol, which involved some aspect of spirituality. And the way we did it was basically a menu approach, which puts the entire control and agency, I should say, over how and whether to incorporate spirituality in the hands of the patient. So what we basically do at the beginning of the group is ask the patients, is spirituality relevant to your treatment? Is it relative to your symptoms? Relevant to your symptoms and get them to speak about it. And then we provide them with a handout. And the patient looks at the handout and selects. These are beliefs that mean something to me and I can use. These are ideas, these are behaviors that I can use. So I'm not telling them what to do. I'm not prescribing pray three times a day and you won't feel depressed because I wouldn't do that anyway. I'm giving the agency to the patient and that's critical um, within a cognitive behavior framework. Okay, so I was very proud of the protocol and we went to a staff meeting to present it and pandemonium 
broke loose. Um, there were a lot of concern, especially from the psychiatric nurses, that this is a tense topic. What if patients decompensate? What if patients have different religious beliefs and they start you know, fighting with each other? Um, are you sure you're not gonna offend anyone? Oh, here is one. We have psychotic patients who have religious delusions and you're gonna tell them to have more, you're gonna tell them that they might have more faith. Like maybe this is gonna help them. Are you out of your mind? Like, what are you trying to accomplish here? So, and also, is this gonna be a mandatory group? Like, are we gonna mandate patients to have spiritual psychotherapy in a secular setting? So I'm like, Dr. Bjorkmanson, please, you handle this one. And he did, he said, this is not gonna be a mandatory group. This is voluntary. Secondly, if clinicians don't think a patient should be going, then they won't go. We're not gonna overrule the clinical team. However, um, regarding the, sp the spiritual patients with religious psychosis, let's figure that one out. And Ross Maron's gonna hit the books and see, is it iatrogenic to provide patients who have psychosis with religious therapy? Is there any precedent for this? <laughs> also, I consulted with the head of the psychotics the program, uh, psychotic program division at our hospital. By the way, both of those turned up null. I didn't find any precedent in the literature to suggest that patients with religious psychosis or OCD worsen when they're provided with spiritual psychotherapy. It's not exactly a lot of literature, but whatever there is, I didn't find anything. And I got sign off from the uppers, so we were good to go. But it was interesting that people were really up in arms about it. And um, what we also said we would do is monitor the group. We would do it on a trial basis. We would do it for six months and we would collect data hey, it's a medical center, that's what we do anyway. So we got IRB approval and we created this protocol and we piloted it and we got data from our patients to see were there decompensations with the understanding that if things really went off the rails, then we would stop. How do you think it went? Well, I'm standing here, so it must've gone pretty well, right? Um, the protocol again was really simple. We introduced the subjects. We talk to patients, we ask them a question is, how is your spirituality relevant to your symptoms? Sometimes they need a little bit more prompting because it's a sophisticated question. Sometimes they'll just start speaking about like their spiritual histories, their, you know, their, their faith in God. They used to be Christian Catholic, now they're not Catholic. They used to have the, you know, had, had a, were involved in the clergy sex abuse scandal. Whatever it is, we try to redirect them and really, is this a resource for you? Is it a source of struggle? Does it color the way your symptoms manifest or is it not relevant? And all of those are fair answers. And basically those are the four types of answers that patients give. And then we give them the menu and we have them look through it and identify one or two things that they can do. And that takes up about 50 minutes with a group, 30 to 50 minutes, depending on the size of the group and depending on the patients. So week by week, interest grew. In fact, they started us off in one of the side rooms. Like, you know, in any psychiatric unit, you're gonna have larger rooms and smaller rooms. So we started off in like the back corner, like, okay, like let's, you know, you're only gonna have two patients anyway who are interested in this thing, right? A voluntary group. So we quickly outgrew that space. Uh, and in fact, this became one of the more popular groups in the entire program. And um, it was also uh, very interestingly, uh, one of the, uh, the number one reasons for the patients who came uh, they have an exit survey. When they leave McLean Hospital, they write down what are the things that impacted you the most in their treatment. And out of the 70, 80 patients who participated in our group, there were 10% of them wrote specifically unprompted the, spirit, the, the spirituality and CBT group as the most impactful aspect of their treatment. So basically it was a success. We, we wrote this up. It was published in the Journal of Cognitive Psychotherapy. Um, and in terms of our results, if you will, 90% of our patients, more than 90% of our patients found that the group was respectful of all faiths and it was a multi-faith group. 99% of the patients, um, sorry, 99% of the patients said it was respectful. 90% of the patients found that it was clinically helpful to them in some way. And here was really interesting. Only 42% of our patients, sorry, only 60% of our patients were affiliated with a religious group. I'm gonna say that again. This is a voluntary group, which involves spirituality in one of the least religious enclaves of the United States of America. And 60%, only 60% of the patients had a religious affiliation. 40% of the patients were not religious and they still came to the group and they still did well. That's gonna be important. Um, interestingly, patients' le levels of religious and spiritual involvement, whether they were religious or not, did not predict how well they did in the group. 
Now, we did not replicate that in subsequent findings with larger samples. However, it, the correlations, as you'll see in the other data that I'm going to share, the, what's interesting about spiritual psychotherapy is that many religious patients don't want it, and many non-religious patients do want it. So it turns out that the one question that we ask, which is, is there a religious group you affiliate with? That's in like any psychiatry, you know, any psychiatry, psychology, there's one demographic question, right? Is there a religious group you affiliate with? It tells us nothing. It tells us nothing about our patients and about whether we should integrate care. What we really need to ask is, do you want spirituality to be part of your care? I did ask that question and I'll get to that soon. Okay, so the fellowship ended. I finished up the group, we wrapped it up, we published it, it was nice. Um, and then I'm like, what next, right? As a one-year fellowship. So I did manage to get some philanthropic funding to be able to continue on a, basically a part-time basis doing this research for four or five more years. And the first step was just to quantify among our patients, the levels of spiritual and religious involvement. And those are on your screen right now. I was shocked. I could not believe that nearly two thirds of our patients had religious affiliation and that 71% were praying, were, had fairly or greater belief in God. The prayer one was totally outstanding, totally, uh, totally uh, surprising to me. And a similar number reported 80% in a subsequent study using religion to cope with, spirit, with their, their mental health in some way. Okay, I understand that in the Netherlands, there's a Bible belt somewhere, right? Okay, so in America, we also have a Bible belt. Boston is not in the Bible belt. Boston is as far away from the Bible belt as you could possibly be. Yet, these are the findings that we're seeing. I actually wanted to quantify the extent to which patients wanted spirituality to be involved in their care. And what we found was that 68% of our patients in Northeastern Massachusetts wanted spirituality to be involved in their treatment. They want to speak to the clinicians here, to myself as well, about their spiritual and religious lives, which was about three times as much as I was expecting. Even if it were 10 or 20% of psychiatric patients who want to have spirituality as a part of their care, that behooves our field to have clinical innovations in order to provide for those patients' spiritual needs in treatment. But 60%, now if we're ignoring it, who's, it's a shame on us. Um, and I presented that to, to, the, to, to the hospital. And it was funny, my colleagues were like, well, it's probably the psychotic patients, right? <laughs> or like, it's those folks with mania and they're hypomanic and they're trying to gravitate towards any new goal-directed behavior, including your new spirit program, like go for it, right? That's what's really going on. Or it's, um, who else? It's the OCD patients, right? It's all the obsessives. Um, so I'm like, well, I have the data, I can check that, and I did, and the logistic regressions were null. Clinical diagnosis did not predict current interest in spiritual psychotherapy, with one exception, which is current depression. Currently depressed patients are more likely to want to have spiritual psychotherapy. I see some of you nodding. I don't know why. Maybe they're looking for hope, meaning, connection. I don't know. I have my theories. Um, but um, for, for whatever reasons was, it was not those folks with religious symptoms, and it certainly wasn't the psychotic folks, interestingly. What was more interesting, though, to me, it was similar, like I said before, um, the, these religious affiliation did predict greater interest. So people who are more religious are more likely to want to speak with their, their, their clinicians. However, there were a sizable nu number, excuse me, of religiously uninvolved patients. In fact, 37%, more than a third of patients with no religious affiliation still had substantial interest in speaking to their clinicians about their spirituality. That's an interesting finding to me. I think what it means above all, again, is that clinicians cannot conclude based on demographic data alone that spirituality is or is not relevant to a patient. You actually have to ask them, is this relevant to you? So in subsequent studies that I was doing during this period, not relevant to psychotherapy, but I think it's important to cover this, this data. We looked at spiritual religious predictors of subsequent treatment. This is not spiritual psychotherapy. This is regular run-of-the-mill, non-spiritual cognitive behavior therapy for acute psychiatric patients with depression, with significant depression. And what we found was that patients who believed in God, I should say actually, to the extent to which patients believed in God, spelled out G-O-D in our questionnaire in order to provide a conservative test of the findings, 
to the extent that they believed in God, they, were, they, they had greater reductions in, in depression, greater reductions in self-harm, and greater improvements in psychological well, well-being over the course of a two-year secular cognitive behavior therapy course. And what was truly interesting was that those findings were mediated by people's faith in the treatment. People had greater belief in treatment credibility and expectancies. They expected more. In other words, if people believe in God, they're more likely to believe that a clinician can help them. And that turns out to be the primary mediating factor. In fact, when we looked at it, we found that there were only two patients, two patients with no belief at all, two atheists in the sample, true atheists in the sample, who fell in the top quartile of believing that treatment would help them. It's very hard if you have a psychiatric, severe psychiatric disorder to maintain faith in your treatment without having a spiritual base, apparently. Um, in a more recent study, we tracked 80, psychi 80 mood disorder, geriatric mood disordered patients over time. And we followed them every three or six months over a three year period. So a nice, nice amount of data. We assessed for spirituality, depression, and suicidality over time. And we computed metrics to identify the mean and the maximum levels of depression and suicidality. And what was interesting in this sample was that um, all these different aspects of faith, of, of religion rather, whether it's affiliation or importance of religion, how important it is to you, how often they're going to services or the degree to which they believe or have faith in God, predicted substantially less suicidality, but not less depression. And that's important because there are religious individuals who get depressed, right? That's, that's part of life. However, even in the throes of depression, their maximum levels of suicidality and their likelihood of having a suicidal episode, if you will, over the course of a three-year period is substantially less. If you look at the odds ratios, they're very low, 0.18, it's a fifth, right? 0.33 is a third. So that's the range. A third likely in, of, of having significant suicidality over the course of three years. And this is not a religious sample. That's what's particularly interesting. So that was, these are the types of research that we're doing again. Um, however, and I wanna emphasize this, like all aspects of life, religion can be a context for struggles. In fact, it can create struggles. People can suffer because of their religion. It is not all fun and games. It is very much a double-edged sword. So the one edge of the sword is what I just presented, which is pretty impressive. But the other edge is pretty nasty. It's really nasty. In this study, we found that we were able to predict, this happens to be among psychotic patients, although we've replicated in depressed patients as well, that spiritual struggles, so when patients have, they believe that God's out to get them, they feel that God's punishing them in some way, they feel disconnected from a faith community, those kinds of factors, we were able to account for an astonishing 46% of the variance. It's an R-squared value, which is pretty high, of pre-treatment suicidality when they were coming into the hospital um, in terms of the intensity and the frequency of their suicidality. What was really interesting here though, and we've seen this in another number of other studies is that spiritual struggles, try this on for size, they occur equally likely in people who do and do not believe. I was chatting with some folks uh, uh, before the conference about Julie Eckstein's work. Julie Eckstein, who's uh, uh, not quite a colleague, she's more of a mentor yeah, at Case Western Reserve, who's found that atheists also have spiritual struggles, right? She, as she says, you'll ask on page one of the questionnaire, do you believe in God? And the answer is no. And on page two of the same questionnaire, are you angry at God? Livid. It's a very common thing. Not all atheists are emotional atheists, as she puts it. Some people are what she calls flatliners. They both don't believe in God and they don't have any emotion towards God. So don't get me wrong on that. And by the way, what does that mean for theologians out there? I don't know. Have fun with that one. Um, that's not my domain. Um, but what we have found in our psychiatric samples is that spiritual struggles are equally likely to occur among people who do and do not affiliate. And furthermore, the effect sizes of those spiritual struggles are equal in those two groups. So we are equally likely to predict the level of suicidality, the level of depression, independent of a patient's level of religious involvement, whether they do or do, do not go to church, do or do not affiliate, do or do not even believe in God, we can still predict using a spiritual struggles measure, their anger at God, their struggle with the faith community, all these kinds of things, their level of distress. And it's a high level of distress dependent on that. 
Here's another finding which we have. Um, just a little bit of background for those of you who don't do MRI research. I'm kind of new to it myself. The insular region is known to be more active in people who have anxiety and connectivity of that unit, that area called the insula, it means that it either goes online or offline together. The insular connectivity is when a person has the anxiety response and it all like pff, the blood is flowing to that section or they're not online. What you really want is like a little bit, not so much, then you can regulate it a lot. But if you're suddenly flooded with uh, brain activation in the insula, it's gonna be a ton of anxiety all at once. It's a good, it's a decent neural indicator of, a, of, a, of an anxiety disorder. This study among 32 or older adults, both with and without mood disorders, we did a resting state fMRI, which means that they're in the scanner without doing, they don't fall asleep, but they can't do anything in the scanner. They're not engaged in the task for about 10 minutes. And they completed measures of spiritual struggles, feeling abandoned by God and loved by God, being punished by God. And what we're seeing is that spiritual struggles, their neural signature, if you will, is one of them is greater insular connectivity, which is an indication that these individuals are more prone or likely at the neural level, potentially to struggle with anxiety disorders and the like. This one's not published yet, but preview of coming attractions, we hope. All right, so I'm fast forwarding and getting back to my story. This is the kind of research I've been doing over the last few years, but I really wanted to get back to the clinical innovation and finding ways to integrate this into treatment in order to improve the lives of patients with psychiatric disorders. I'm at McLean Hospital, that's our mission, and that's what I like to do. So the hospital actually, there was this, this is a major turning point, a big step forward, I would say, is that the, the research started turning heads. I mean, I, I presented at Grand Rounds a couple of times. I was able to answer my colleagues based on my data, I published a couple of papers in decent journals, and it was really garnering more interest within the community and more philanthropic funding, which is never a bad thing. And this program called the Spirituality and Mental Health Program um, really provided, if you will, official recognition within the echelons of McLean Hospital for the importance of spirituality on terms of research, in terms of training, and also in terms of practice, which is essentially the mission of the hospital. So immediately I started getting calls after this was launched um, and the hospital president literally called me up himself and he said, hey, it's time to do this. So I thought that was a good sign. Um, but almost immediately I started getting calls from the unit saying, hey, what do we do? Like, how do we actually address this with our patients? And I saw that there was a great opportunity. So I applied for funding from the Bridges Consortium. And fortunately, we won a grant, to, which was um, uh, funded by the John Templeton Foundation to advance research practice of spiritual integrated psychotherapy. And we took the opportunity to, to revise our spirituality and cognitive behavior therapy program, the one I did when I was an intern and a postdoc, and to create a more formal structure, which ended up being dubbed SPIRIT, Spiritual Psychotherapy for Inpatient, Residential, and Intensive Treatment. And yes, we really lucked out with the name. Um, so the idea of spirit is to be able to deliver spiritual psychotherapy to acute psychiatric patients and to have a flexible protocol. When you're dealing with acute psychiatry, you got to be flexible. So the group, interestingly, can be delivered in 25 minutes, 45 minutes, or 50 minutes. There's enough material that a clinician can use. They can expand it or they can contract it. They also have different handouts that they can use. So we provide them now with seven handouts instead of just two, one for cognitive and one for behavioral, as I did however many years ago. Um, so uh, now we provide them with seven. So the clinician really has like an arsenal and they'll usually only use one or two, but it's enough material for a decently trained clinician to be able to use this material with whatever patients come in. If patients come in and they're reporting spiritual struggles, we have a handout. If they're talking about prayer, we have a handout for that. If they are talking about forgiveness, there's a handout for forgiveness. If let's say you're in a residential program and you're gonna see the same patients for three or four weeks, so now you have different handouts that you can use every week as opposed to being boring. It makes a difference. And this is the kind of way that Spirit, it's a flexible clinical protocol used in acute psychiatry. That's really the goal of it. And Spirit was born. So um, this is a, what we did in, for the Bridges Consortium was a year-long project and we developed the treatment. We trained clinicians in it. I ended up recruiting again, 22 clinicians and um, we monitored their, their patient responses to the treatment. Like, how is this going? How is it tolerated? Do they, are they decompensating? Because now we weren't just doing it in one unit, we're doing it across 250 beds. It's a sizable increase in responsibility. And we revised our protocol. So as I mentioned before, the group starts out by asking patients a very 
I'm not going to call it a simple question. It's a specific question. How is your spirituality or religion relevant to your mental health? And again, patients usually respond in one of four ways, actually in, sometimes in multiple ways, but it's these four categories. They either say that it's a resource to them, it helps them have hope, meaning, purpose, connection, a sense of peace. It gives them, a, 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 like I said, hope for the future, faith in something, gives them a sense of gratitude towards something, positive, the positive side, that's the one answer. The second answer is the negative, they're struggling with it. They feel punished by God, they feel alone, they feel isolated, they feel that their depression or whatever it is, is a curse or a punishment, the negative side. A third group will have spiritual symptoms. Those are the folks with religious OCD. They might have religious psychosis, they might have religious mania. I've seen it even in eating disorders once or twice, not common, but it does happen. And the fourth group say, no, it's not really relevant, but I want to check out the spirit group anyway. And hey, all are welcome. It's America. So that's the group. Oh, sorry. And then we have the handouts. So that's the first part of the group. And in the second part of the group, the clinician set, selects one of those seven handouts, sometimes two, usually not more than that. And they provide that to the patients. They go through it and tie it up with a bow. And that's the end of the group. All right, so these are the clinicians. Interestingly, um, they are uh, diversely religious, uh, diversely trained, and uh, actually uh, the, at McLean Hospital, it's like it's known to be predominantly Caucasian. So we actually had a disproportionate number relative to McLean of individuals who are not white and are, who, who are clinicians. I'm not sure what that's about, maybe more respect for diversity, even though it, it's less about clinicians' interest in religion and more about clinicians' respect for a diversity variable. Spirituality and religion is a aspect of, religion, of, of diversity and diverse identities after all. So th that could be a piece of it. Um, in terms of the context, so uh, I mentioned before, uh, McLean, I'm really blessed to work at McLean for a variety of reasons, but uh, one of them is the, the specialized units. I mean, to be able, it's not just a general psychiatry unit with 40 beds that anybody's gonna come in, whether they're psych psychotic or depressed or, or otherwise or manic. This is, these are specialized units just for, just for people with mood disorders or just geriatric patients. Sometimes we had one for geriatric patients with mood and, uh, um, uh, and uh, um, also dementia, highly specialized unit. So it's a pretty cool place. Um, and, but that also provided us with a great lab to be able to really test out like, which are the patients that this works for? Are there groups that it does not work for? Um, and, and what can we do here? So it's a really ideal setting. Um, we also had a very eclectic and diverse group of patients. You probably can't see the, num the actual words on the slide, but you can see that there's a lot of different uh, triangles in there into the, so which, which basically means that it's a diverse group, both in terms of spiritual and religious involvement and clinically. 30% had a depressive episode, 23% um, had substance abuse or alcohol abuse, 20% had psychotic disorders, and about 5% had a PTSD. Just a couple of numbers to give you ideas. And all of this is available in the papers that I published, by the way, which I'm happy to disseminate. All right. We asked patients, to what extent did this group help you to identify resources that you can use to reduce your distress? Did you actually get something out of this spirit group? And as you can see, I think we did pretty darn well. People, people appreciated this. They saw that this is fairly moderately or very much on the whole, something that is helpful to them. They're able to get it, um, to get something out of it. Um, the vast majority of patients is about 70%, about a thousand patients said that it helped them to identify things, identify something they could use in some way. Um, and uh, what was also uh, interesting, well, actually, no, that's the next paper. So after that paper that we published, which was in the American Journal of Psychotherapy, which is basically, it has our entire clinical protocol. I didn't mention this. We published our entire spirit clinical pro protocol in that journal. So it is fully available in the, in the public domain. I'd be very happy if individuals take it and use it elsewhere. This is not, you know, this is not, uh, not under copyright with no royalties. Um, in the subsequent paper, we looked at predictors of response. Which factors are associated with better or worse 
reporting by patients of what they got out of group. And this was published in uh, Psychiatric Services, also an APA, American Psychiatric Association Journal. Interestingly, demographic factors were not significant. And this is important because many people, at least in America, believe, believe <laughs> that um, age is gonna be a predictor. Spiritual psychotherapy is for people who are older. It's not for younger folks. It's not for the millennials, the Gen Xers, right? People who are sitting on TikTok, like they're not interested. That's not our data. Our data does not suggest that, that even younger individuals um, are, 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 you know, they, they get something out of the group the same. People who are college students, people who are, have a disability based on their psychiatric diagnosis, race and the like. Regarding psychiatric diagnosis, there too, I was surprised. I thought maybe substance and alcohol abuse patients might have more interest in spirit because 12 step is like a big part of treatment. Or maybe it was, you know, currently depressed patients because our previous data showed that. And none of that panned out. Diagnosis was independent, which is really neat to have a clinical protocol at a specialized hospital with so many units. And it actually functions essentially the same no matter where you go in the hospital. That's a good indicator that we could really put this into general psychiatry onto mixed units and not have to worry on a diagnostic level about who is and isn't involved. Um, with regards to spiritual and religious characteristics, so here, since the sample was so large, we did find an effect. And as you can see, there's significant effects, but the actual clinical effect is not, is not huge. The effect size is small, although the p-value is highly significant given the, given the size of the sample, of course it's gonna be. But like an R-value of 0.28, it's like 3% of the variance. Nah, yeah, it's not, it's not very much. 0.09 is actually 1% of the variance, if I'm not mistaken. Um, R.16, it's not, it's, these are not high effect sizes. These are, these, are, these, are, these are very, very, in fact, very small. Nevertheless, patients who have more religious and, and, and spiritual involvement in their lives are more likely to say that they get something out of this treatment group to some degree, but not to a large degree, not to the degree that you would expect. Um, in fact, when we looked at this further, and what we found is that 80% of patients with no religious affiliation still reported getting benefit from the group. So spiritual therapy, psychotherapy is not just for religious individuals. All right, this was the most fascinating finding though. We looked at um, clinical factors or clinician factors. First, clinician age. So what we found is that older clinicians were better at providing spirit. Gender was not, education was not. So independent of their level of training. That latter one's important because you could be a psychology fellow, you could be a social work student, you could be an intern, you could be a seasoned clinician and still be able to provide spirit the same. Um, what about current religious affiliation? Any guesses? Would you say that religious or non-religious clinicians are better at providing spirit or no difference? Without looking at the slide. Non-religious? Okay, you happen to be right. Did you read my paper? Non-religious clinicians are actually better at providing spirit. What was that? Oh, Rebecca Probst. Oh, so, so yes. So Rebecca had the same, she had the same exact finding. Um, that's true, back in 1992. Um, that non-religious clinicians had better effects than religious clinicians in providing, in providing spirit. Go figure, right? That's why we do research. Here's that data. Um, and um, we actually wanted to look at why. Like, what, what is this finding? Like, why are, why is, Apparently, like religious affiliation, I'm like my religious affiliation is a risk factor for delivering this treatment that I created myself. So it's a funny, right? What is that about? Um, so what we found is that non-religious clinicians, we we published this in a subsequent uh, paper in the Journal of Psychotherapy, um, which is that non-religious clinicians were more likely to use dialectical behavior therapy. They were more likely to use to see it as a dialectic. Um, which is probably more than we have time to discuss now, but basically that there are different sides. There's an acceptance and then there's also change. And we focus on both of those at the same time. And that way of approaching spirituality seems to enhance its delivery. I guess it is important. When we're providing spiritual psychotherapy, it's important not to prescribe, pray three times a day, you know, uh, you know, Go, let's go back to church and everything will be all right. 
it's important to in nudge people in some ways towards change while accepting where they are currently. All psychotherapy when practiced this way is really effective. This is the core of dialectical behavior therapy, but particularly spiritual psychotherapy, it's very important to move into that dialectic between where we are now and where we want to be and to recognize those two sides of the coin. And when clinicians do that, they are better at providing this treatment and non-religious clinicians are better at doing that for reasons that I will allow you to discuss during the next time, next break or whatever it is. All right, so what are the next steps with this research? We did just receive on Monday, in fact, some funding to create a more formal training program in spirit. I was very lucky to be able to do this work again at McLean because it's a, it's a great environment. We have all these specialized units and also I'm a known entity there. But when we're going beyond McLean, we really need to have a formalized training program. I can't just, I mean, I could just give people the protocol and say, have fun, but that's harder to do than actually formalizing it. So we just received funding again on Monday to create a formalized training program in spirit, which is a video training which, which, uh, in which I myself explain the treatment, plus we have a demonstration with a mock spirit group, and it alternates between those two, so it's multimodal training. And clinicians will participate in a year-long um, internship, if you will, in spirit, in which they are signing up to deliver the treatment within an acute psychiatric facility, residential, intensive, um, or, 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 or similar, or, or, uh, or inpatient. Um, 40 times over a 52 week year, reasonable bar. Um, and they, the clinicians provide measures, the patients provide measures and we get data from the patient's medical records and that completes their internship. At the end, they have a certificate and they have provided it and uh, we can go from there. And the idea and the hope is that we can, through this training program, start to pilot it and see whether the training helps clinicians to deliver spiritual psychotherapy, whether what, what response that has on the patients. And then eventually I'm hoping to be able to scaffold that um, to be able to use in, in other sites beyond McLean and beyond the, the Harvard Medical School Network. Um, I am definitely looking for partners around the world to do this kind of work. So if people here are on psychiatric units, acute psychiatric units, and you're interested, then you're definitely welcome to come over to me afterwards. And those are basically the next steps um, with this line of research and we'll see where it goes came from modest beginnings and I don't know, we'll see. Uncertainty is part of life, right? Um, okay, I'll make some concluding remarks and then I think we have a couple minutes for questions, yeah? Does anyone know what this is a picture of? It is a stadium, it's not a soccer match. Okay, before I answer, I'll ask you another question. Does anyone know what the most widely practiced mental health treatment is on planet Earth today? <clears throat> Did you say Pentecostal? <laughs> Are you answering the first question or the second? Um, what's the most widely practiced mental health treatment on planet Earth today? Any guesses? Did you say prayer? So it's interesting, prayer is not a mental health treatment. It might be used by people to cope with mental health, but I mean an actual treatment recognized by the world written up in journals. Exercise would not be a mental health treatment. It's a really good idea though. I'm sure you have it here in the Netherlands, Alcoholics Anonymous. All right, so 12 step programs. There are 4 million members worldwide in, in, in these programs. If you lump the number of people going to 12-step programs and you lump all the people doing all of the psychiatric care, the first, is the, the first is a larger number. That's their international convention. It's pre-COVID granted, but this is their biannual convention. How, how many of you have been to the American Psychiatric Association convention? I know Ariane has. How many people come? A big year would be like 5,000, right? Maybe 10,000, right? You can't compare. There's something amazing that happens when you provide spiritual psychotherapy. You know what happens? People show up. People actually want this. And that's the story. 
this isn't coming from clinicians. It's not coming from theology. It's coming from patients. That's what happens. Now, when it comes to alcohol and substance abuse, we accept it. But in the rest of psychiatry, you, you got to be a little crazy to do this kind of work almost, um, unless we actually see what's going on, which is that patients want it, irrespective of their levels of religion in many cases. And that's the experience that I've had. That's the experience at McLean. That's what my data is suggesting, that we need to be a lot more open to the topic because as somebody was saying before, um, mental health is, well, I'm gonna paraphrase, it's going off a cliff really fast. <laughs> Things are getting very, very intense. And if we wanna service our patients going forward, the droves of individuals who are struggling with depression and anxiety and self-injury and suicidality, then this could be a critical part of the, of the, of the solution going forward. Thank you very much. Appreciate your enthusiasm. It seems as if you have been able to keep the ability to um, be surprised again and again alive. So, uh, uh, very nice listening to you. Yeah. Um, we have just a few minutes for just a few questions. Are there questions in the chat? Yes. question by Ainu Mardia. How universal your spiritual program? I think how universal is your spiritual program? Because it can be used regardless of religious affiliation. Do you not refer the program to any religious affiliation? Can you share me with, with me the example of the module? Yes. Um, how um, multi-faith is this? Um, I would say spirit is for anybody who wants to participate in it. And it doesn't matter whether they do or don't believe. It doesn't matter whether they do affiliate with a specific group. Um, in regards to the sharing the module, it's all, in, it's all open source. Hey, it's literally online. Um, or you can email me and I'll have one of my lab assistants uh, send you a copy of it. Um, you will find certain aspects of the treatment that are more sectarian than others. Um, but, um, those are, it's very much a menu approach and patients again, can utilize those or not utilize those. Uh, there was a group in Brazil that recently contacted me and they were adapting this for use within a Catholic population. So they wanted to put more sectarian material in it for their specific hospital, which services a large number of Catholic patients. And I think that's appropriate. I think that's culturally appropriate. I could see that being done in the Muslim world. I could see it being done in, in Israel and in, in the Jewish world. I could see it being done in a number of different places. <laughs> I don't think that's a problem to adapt it, but the goal here that I have is, acute, is, is mainstream psychiatry. And I think in order to do that, it's, it, it's better to be a little bit more open about these things. Um, it seems to be a, a more effective approach. Okay. <clears throat> Renee. Um, I just wonder, did you did you also um, investigate meaning uh, uh, in in the sense of that uh, these patients strive for meaning because this is what I see. This is really universal, and this is uh, what especially psychiatric patients strive for to get meaning, to get an understanding of their disease, to get a, a perspective in their life. Uh -huh. This is not religious uh, in a in a in a in a more narrow sense. Um, is there a focus on meaning? I think, if, again, the, the materials are diverse enough that people can extract certain aspects of faith that are relevant to them. For people who are more depressed, I could see meaning being critical. For people who are more anxious, I could see faith being more critical. And the data does play that out a little bit um, in, in some of the things, some of the research that I've seen. Uh, for people who are coping with substance and alcohol abuse, uh, the idea of being truthful the idea of ethics, the idea of virtues, those might tend to be more, and that's why AA is chock full of those. So I think that's probably more specific to patients with mood disorders, I would, I would just imagine about the piece about meaning, not that anybody couldn't benefit from meaning, um, but, um, but you know, uh, the, again, the, the materials are intended to be religiously, spiritually 
culturally diverse enough with latent themes that, that allows a degree of freedom, both for the clinician to deliver it and for the patient to receive it. One last question. So, yeah. You said you um, make a combination with dialectical behavior modification, and you also say there are some special special kinds of attitude in behavior in the the electrical behavior modification which work well extra well so as you say it it is um it is something else when you put it in a program with another theoretical um, um attitude to the patients yeah the, um, the finding that DBT seems to enhance the provision of spirit, um, the, um, it's not clear which aspect of DBT, but probably it's that, that was somewhat conjecture on my part, the piece about um, acceptance and change. N nevertheless, um, I do think a general approach to, uh, let me back up. Spirit is a um, protocol that can be de delivered utilizing primarily cognitive behavioral, but really multimodal ways of providing treatment. And I think when it comes to DBT, if having that layer over it does seem to enhance its provision. One question from the chat. Oh, another one. We have an encore. Okay. And we don't want to forget about the chat. Although we can select only one, uh, sorry for the others. Uh, a question by Sri Padmasari. Do you exclude inpatients who have religious delusions? No, no, we did not exclude patients with religious delusions. And I'll tell you why. <coughs> Firstly, I did not find any data to suggest that patients with religious delusions decompensate when provided with spiritual psychotherapy. Second, I consulted with a number of colleagues about this, um, including, names escaping me because I'm jet lagged. Um, but, the, uh, but I consulted with a number of colleagues about this and I did not see a precedent for it, neither in the clinical literature or by the experts in the field. But more importantly, when we deliver spirit to patients, even if they have religious OCD or religious delusions, one of the advantages, in fact, of providing spiritual psychotherapy, when patients have religious delusions, this is a longer topic than just a question, but I'll do my best. Um, they are essentially have aspects of their psychopathology, which are co-opting or hijacking their spirituality. So instead of having a delusion that they are, the, you said you had a queen in the Netherlands? Fine, instead of being the queen of the Netherlands, they are um, a religious figure. They have, they, have, uh, they have prophecy. So it's the same thing, it's just hijacking their religion as opposed to their secular culture. That, needs to be differentiated from normative healthy aspects of their religion. For example, let's say they believe, let's say they, they use religion to cope in a positive way. So those need to be in some ways, the Venn diagram needs to be drawn where you have their normative healthy aspects of their spirituality on one side, and then you have spiritual symptoms. Providing spiritual psychotherapy enables that contrast to occur within their psyche. It gives them the ability to distinguish, this is my faith and these are my symptoms. So if anything, we're seeing positive effects of patients with religious symptoms receiving spiritual psychotherapy because it allows for that bifurcation or that distinction, which can thereby give them more insight, more motivation to deal with their, treat, with their, with their actual symptoms and uh, more awareness. Where, do my, where does my delusions end and where does my real spirituality begin? <laughs>